Okay. We're rolling. All right. All right. This is an interview at Division Military Naval Affairs Headquarters, Latham, New York, the 21st of March, 2007, approximately 10 a.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Amy Lynn Klamowitz, born 26 March, 1965. And where? I was born in West Palm Beach, Florida. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? I reached a master's uh, with uh, Central Michigan University Public Administration. Okay. Um, why did you decide to go into the service? Money for school, primarily. I'm a Razzi Nazi, as they say. Um, didn't have, I wanted to go to a good school and uh, didn't have the cash. So, like a lot of folks, um, use the Army as a vehicle to go ahead and get my bachelor's. And of course, I owed about eight years. When I picked my head up after eight years, I said, hey, I got the hard part done, so I figured I'd stick it out. So, mm -hmm. I'm with the Army. Okay, so you went to Davidson? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, what was uh, your ROTC training like? What do you remember of it? Painful. Just painful. They were looking for women. It, um, the school they was in had just opened up to women, so the ratio was very similar to the Army, about 10% women. So uh, it, was, uh, it was prime pickings for me. So that part was good. But I will tell you, um, during that time, um, Davidson was a very liberal college, so we wore uniforms. I got a very small taste of what it must have been like back in the 70s with uh, the folks that you had a public opinion that wasn't so favorable toward the military. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, I got told to sit in the back of the class, and you know, so it, it was it was a it, it was a great experience with regard to how we're treated now. You know, where I get patted on the back and you know bought coffee in the airports, so. Yeah, it was a big difference in 20 years that I saw. Mm -hmm. just based on How were you treated by the males within the program? Oh, very good. I mean, they were my buddies. It was, Davidson mm -hmm. is a small school, so mm -hmm. uh, I actually was dating one of the guys in there, so they wanted me not to mess with me, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, but it was a, uh, I was one of two women out of 100 in the program, so it was, um, it was just, I was kind of uh, treated differently, a little bit differently, but not in a bad way. Mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. And again, I, I think I got preferential treatment, in fact, because uh, you know, there was only two people that got active duty out of that group. And of course, I didn't want it. But you know, I, now that I look back, I thank God I got it. So. Mm -hmm. But you felt that uh, um, on campus, though, you were not treated that I used well. to dread Tuesdays, just because we had to wear a uniform on Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. And we had to PT at 5 in the morning. and. Uh, you know, the ROTC people gave it back to the students. We used to scream as we ran our uh, our cadence through the dorms just to kind of, you know, give it back. And, uh, yeah, so it was really, there's a little bit of tension there. But uh, not like, you know, you see in some schools, but certainly it was, uh, it was a love-hate. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when you left, then you had your lieutenant bars. I did. And what, what did you do after that? I went to Korea. I remember seeing my orders, uh, and they said, Yongsan, KS. I thought, Yongsan, Kansas? Wow, how neat. <laughs> and my uncle was in the Air Force. He says, ah, you're not going to be in Kansas, honey. That's Korea South. So uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a wild time. It was um, actually during the 1988 Seoul Olympics, and um, Korea was trying to put on its best face for the world. You know, it was, uh, it was really exciting. I worked in a as a platoon leader in a truck company, went up and down the peninsula um, doing kind of like a FedEx mission for high, high priority cargo and, you know, gotten about four accidents and uh, it was just insane. I mean, the driving over there, as, as, if you've ever been overseas, is uh, incredible. No respect for time and space. They just plow right through, you know, and, mm -hmm. yeah, so. How, how did, um, how do you think you were treated? How do you think the local people felt toward you? I will tell you this. Turn. I will tell you I had an advantage, you know, I'm um, Caucasian, um, and they prefer pale skin. Um, the women um, are obviously lower on the totem pole, so I, got, I took a hit there. But um, I'm also tall, so it helps to be tall and pale. And mm -hmm. the only thing I took a hit on was the female piece, you know. So, uh, but if you were short, black, and uh, you know, you had a hard, and female, you had a real hard time over there with 
with your Koreans paying attention to you. I mean, more than half of my platoons were folks called Katusas, Koreans augmenting the U.S. Army, which mm -hmm. is something you don't find anywhere else in the world, you know, where they're drafted Koreans, the ones that speak English are allowed to serve in our platoon. So mm -hmm. um, it was a very culturally intense program where I had men that would never listen to women and they had to listen to me and it was, it was hard for them, it was really tough for them. But I think that was probably uh, a, a very memorable experience for them too. How long were you there? Just a year. Just felt like 20. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a long year. Let me ask you, what what uh, branch were you commissioned in? Transportation. Transportation. Yes, sir. That's where okay. I still am. Okay. And uh, did you go to an officer's basic before you went to Korea, or was that Absolutely. after? Absolutely. Yeah, right after you get your commissioning, you you head to OBC, and then a couple of them nice to have TDYs in there. But uh, yeah, that was at Fort Eustis, Virginia. Okay. And it was great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, where did you go after you left Korea? Well, I was going to get out of the army because this was just insane, it's an insane way to approach life. You know, um, you know, I did have some. I, I wanted to see the world a little bit, so I asked for Europe, and in fact, I got it. I got a very posh assignment with the Military Traffic Management Command in uh, the Netherlands. So, uh, which which was just um, incredible. They they said, oh, by the way, here's your thirty-five hundred dollars stipend to uh, go get a new wardrobe because. The status of forces agreements over there didn't want anybody wearing uniforms. So all the soldiers in the Netherlands um, <coughs> got to wear civilian clothes. So that to me was a great way to stair step out of the army and into the civilian world. I dealt with um, all the port contractors there. You know, I got to I had great opportunities. Um, I had a job with Hertz, um, but uh, I just had some personal issues there. I was going through a divorce and I said, well, I know I can do the Army. Let me get out and I get back to Conus, which was my next assignment for Bragg. So uh, I said, let me see what that holds and then I'll get out from there. So I decided not to, not to leave the service at that eight-year mark, which was mm -hmm. when my commitment was up. Now, when did you attend jump school? Um, actually, that was 92, right after I got assigned to Fort Bragg. You oh, don't okay. want to be a leg walking around Fort Bragg. That's uh -huh. just a bad, bad combination. I mean, you... Um, you have to wear a different, I mean, they can see you from way out if you're mm -hmm. a leg, and, and that's all people look at you at Fort Bragg, and they kind of just, well, they don't look at your face, they look at your chest, you know, to see what's going on there, how many patches you got, if you got triple pin, you know, you know how people uh -huh. are. There's a lot of testosterone at Fort Bragg, so it was, um, it was good, but I was in the best shape of my life. I mean, all you do at Fort Bragg is run, mm -hmm. I mean, it's all, I mean, it's really, it's a very physical place. You could be a rock, but if you can run, you're good, mm -hmm. you know? So that's pretty exciting. And got my knocked out my company command there. Went to Haiti. So uh, okay, I saw that. Yeah. Who'd you go with? What unit? The Mighty First Coscom. They are um, they're the big core support command for the division, the 82nd there. So they took a slice of us. And uh, when we were actually loading up, it was it was going in with guns blazing. And then if you remember Aristide, you know, and Colin Powell, Jim Kurt, mm -hmm. would talk them down. So we went in, you know, like a lamb instead of a lion, but. There were folks that, you know, got out of the army because they had already sewn on their little mustard splat for a combat jump into theater. And at that time it was the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So you didn't really get a lot of opportunities to get a combat patch. And so that was a very significant emotional event that it turned from, you know, to a peacekeeping, peacemaking mission from a high intensity conflict. So mm -hmm. I, I saw another side of the army there where there were people that really, really enjoyed fighting. I mean, they really wanted to go get some, you know, and that was Cold War. We didn't, mm -hmm. most people now have lots of opportunities, so I'm sure they're tired, but it was kind of different. It's a different way of looking at it. What was it like in Haiti? Oh, what a, what a dismal country. I mean, uh, I've been to the Bahamas, and I see that the, other than tourism, there's very little industry there. You know, Dominican Republic is probably the poorest of the poor, but Haiti's not much further along. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, uh, they had, uh, at that time, gone through quite a few riots, and uh, there was very little infrastructure left. You know, um, the masses would just hang on the side of the road and just, you know, either try to, uh, you know, get the soldiers to sleep with them, or, you know, uh, you know prostitutes, whatever, would throw them candy, and, you know, they, they just, they were desperate people. And mm -hmm. it's funny you mention that, because I was down at West Point the other day, and I saw a soldier, and he had a Haitian accent, and I asked him where he was from. He said, hey, I was one of those soldiers. <laughs> now, how long were you there for? 
Um, it was only a couple of months. It was a very short mission because, uh, you know, we, again, it was very hard to turn off the Army. Once you have this sort of big mission, you know, to go in like a, with guns blazing, um, uh, they weren't sure what they needed, so they brought everything at mm -hmm. that time. Uh, 10th Mountain was actually coming back from Somalia, and they swung in, and they actually were the occupying division there, too. So uh, once they realized they didn't need all that stuff there, they started sending folks home. So uh, we ended up going home after about two months. I had a two-star general, but uh, you know, if you don't keep those guys occupied, that's just bad business. So mm -hmm. you know, they realized that, they, that that was overkill, and, and they were able to pull out real quick. Again, how were we accepted there? The U.S. How do you, yes. How do you feel? Um, so. After after a, you know being in a war-torn country like that for a while, I think they saw the U.S. troops as really the great white hope that they were going to, you know, because we are so close, they were going to maybe relax some, some immigration policies and, you know, there was a beginning of a new friendship, if you will, and uh, I'm sure over time, you know, as the peacekeeping force occupied and there were, you know, quite a few other nations that, that moved in there other than the U.S., I think those hopes probably die a little bit, but I was there during the, the you know, oh, yeah, here you are. Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking for our money, they're looking mm -hmm. for, our, for our goods, and uh, I think I was there during the most hopeful time, so I think that uh, we were received probably better when I was there than uh, after I left, when Mr. Reality started biting. Where did you go from Haiti? Let's see. Fort Bragging went down to an ACRC assignment, similar to this one right here, and went down and hung out uh, with 377 at that time, TAACOM, which is now um, the Air Support Command. They used to give uh, a slice of active component officers to the reserve component after Desert Storm because they realized, hey, we may need these guys at some point. We need a higher level of readiness. So they decided to infuse some energy and some people um, into the reserve component, to, in, this, in this case, a USAR unit. Um, this unit was very active. I went to Kuwait with those guys. They had a, uh, a real-time mission to do logistics for the brigade that used to sit down in Kuwait, APS-5 now. But um, again, it was the beginning of the change in the reserve components where their expectations were to really be on the front lines, if you will, especially logistics, because 75% mm -hmm. of logistics is, is in the reserve components. So, you know, as an officer, I, as a regular Army officer, I did at that time feel that this was a hit. I'm never going to recover from this as a career move. You know, I'm obviously, you know, I'm, I'm destined for, you know, bottom feeder time. I didn't make the grade, so here I am with the reserves. But uh, that wasn't to be the case. Um, I was picked up for um, CGSC and Leavenworth resident, which, you know, was a big feather. Now, what does CGSC stand for? Um, Command and General Staff College. Okay. It's the, the mm -hmm. one-year school at Leavenworth. So, you know, I thought, oh, maybe they didn't hurt me too bad down there in Louisiana, you know. But uh, that uh, got married, had a baby. Mm -hmm. So I uh, knocked those things out. Still deal with that. But <laughs> that's, uh, after Leavenworth, um, my husband and I, who's also um, the same grade as I am, and uh, he also went to Leavenworth, got picked up as well. And um, we moved off to uh, Fort Riley, which is about two hours west of it. And we did some very heavy jobs there. I was never home. I actually had my mom and dad come and move in with us to take care of the, the kid. And uh, went to National Training Center twice a year, and each of those were 60 day rotations. So, you know, I was gone. It's not fair to say I lived in Fort Riley because I was gone a lot. Mm -hmm. so, How'd you feel to be away from your family like that? Well, I knew it was coming. You know, in an officer's career, which is nice, which since years don't normally get, they get really programmed hard in easy times. You know, they get a real sign curve of, of assignments. And I knew going in those, that was going to be tough, you know. And it was, my, it was my time. You know, it was my time to do heavy Army stuff. So well, I think as long as you plan for that, and you, you know, like I didn't want my kid at a daycare, you know, 20 years mm -hmm. ago, so I mm -hmm. had my mom and I guilted her into moving into this. So. <laughs> That worked out, but every family's different, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, it worked out for my family because of my mom, really. How about your dad? <laughs> yeah, he was there, and he was unreliable, you know, typical male. You know, he's, he's looking for uh, for support instead of giving it, not true entirely, but somewhat true. So I take it they were retired? And they were both retired, mm -hmm. and I pulled them in from the Keys, the Florida Keys. Uh -huh. so that was a very tough sell to go to Manhattan, Kansas. Yeah, <laughs> 
Okay. Um, I guess what happened next? Um, let's see, Fort Riley. Then uh, we got a worship for Korea, and uh, you know that I was I was uh, really hesitant about it. I'd been there before, back in 1988, and uh, I knew how dangerous it was there, um, and not because of the terrorist threat or anything, just because of the way they they live over there. They just uh, they don't have the safety factors like we do. And um, I was pleasantly surprised when we got back. That Korea was a completely different country. Um, they had grown up. You know, it's certainly a first world. There, a lot of them are more connected than we are with regard to automation and, and uh, certainly cell phones. Uh, even ten-year-old kids have cell phones over there. And so when did you go back to Korea? 2002 to 2004. Oh, so you spent two years over there? Yes. Accompanied tours are two. Mm -hmm. Unaccompanied hardship tours are one. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were in a great spot for families. We're down south. You know, the real hard places are north of Seoul. Tondishan, that's where Second ID was. Of course, they've moved everything south now with the new, you know, change in the Now your family policy. was able to go with you? They were. My husband was already in, so he, he got okay. an assignment as well. Okay. So that actually helped us in that mm -hmm. one. Um, and then we lived in these really nice quarters on Camp Walker. Now it was funny because the first time I was there, Koreans were much more pro-American. The second time I was there, a lot of, uh, a lot of dis Dissidents, uh, mm. dissidents would, um, you know, must talk cocktails. We got locked down in our camp quite a few times. A lot of student demonstrations, and um, so it was kind of like uh, our '60s. You know, mm -hmm. where they really felt like an occupied country. Why are Americans still here 50 years later? And now, it's a tough question for me to answer too. I mean, this country has grown up. So, but it was interesting to watch history change. You know, over the 15-year break that I had. So. My husband got picked up for battalion command, but it was an AC, it was an RC command here in Schenectady. So I had to find a job, and I thought I was going to go either to Drum or to um, West Point. And um, then this 42nd ID gig came up, and the small print was they're deploying. So I thought, oh well, you know, get that knocked out. And uh, I went in, and I remember I didn't, um, I was actually assigned to the field training group. I could have stayed in Troy and, you know, done this all year, but. Mm -hmm. um, that was the right thing to do. I went up to talk to General Toledo in September of 04, and he was busy doing the MRX, but he did make time to see me, and he said, hey, I can't afford not to take you. He'll find you a job. So I really got stuffed in at mm -hmm. the last minute, and um, we had a real ragtag group um, going over. It was a, a mayor's cell. I guess as you you know stand up any organization over there, as you become an occupying army, those sort of installation type functions, you know, that make life good, you know, how do you get fuel on a, on a fob, how do you fob as a Ford operating base, mm -hmm. you know, how do you, uh, how do you make life better for soldiers, how do you make life more comfortable, those things become more important as your situation stabilizes. So that was part of the, the, the growth, I think, um, in the Iraqi theater where they wanted to really look at garrison ops. And so actually I worked for an 06 Colonel Hefter you all may know, mm -hmm. but, uh, he stood us up and uh, took this, I mean, we were, everybody was from a different state, it was hilarious, and uh, we replaced this group that was half our size, so we really, um, it was from First ID, and we ended up landing in um, uh, on Spiker, mm -hmm. named after Mark Spiker, who was uh, the Navy pilot that was down during the desert storm, the first desert storm, where he was supposedly um, captured, I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. They actually named that fog because that was the area he was supposedly down in. And, uh, so there's a lot of history of that place. It was very interesting fog. It was like 18 miles around. It was one of the very few that was not in the city. A relatively safe place because you could see the rounds coming. And it was just such a large place that it was doubtful that someone would get hurt. Mm -hmm. Now, were you on, you said combat patrols, you were on patrols? Yes. Um, now, did you carry armor with you all the time, body oh, armor? Yeah. What kind of weapon did you carry? I had an M4 and a 9mm. So, but when I when I went on this, first time I went out, I had just my, my little short, you know, pea shooter. And uh, there was an IED above this overpass. I said, I said, never again. They actually made, at that time, I don't know why, but they made us exit the vehicle, which makes no sense to me. And it made no sense to me at the time. Why would you expose yourself? Because, you know, the, the convoy commander, you, you want to play the game, okay. So you're out there, you know, I've got a pea shooter that can shoot about 50 meters, you know, and I thought, oh, never again. So I actually did end up with an M4, 
on the remaining clips. But, um, but the reason I went, normally a life support mayor person wouldn't do that, wouldn't normally go on clips, but uh, it was a sign of the times over there. We were actually closing a lot of thoughts. We, the 42nd ID, that was one of their main missions, was to really you know, bring in some of the smaller fobs. And, and Spike, her mind was, was a, a large fob, an enduring fob. So uh, I would go out and meet with the, with the mayors, and we would talk about how they were going to close in on, on us. And, uh, now, did you have an interpreter with no, you? No, no, I was talking ba basically with Americans. I dealt with American oh, okay. soldiers. Okay. Um, I remember we sponsored a, um, a school in Tikrit, mm -hmm. which, uh, which uh, I went out with the 1-7, sorry, 2-7 infantry commander from Fort Stewart, and uh, they had, uh, that was a very exciting thing. Um, we went on quite a few clips in support of them. But we would bring money to these schools, and uh, it was interesting to see women in, in leadership positions there because this female for the, uh, the school, she was a real battle axe. I mean, she she took charge, and it was nice to see that because you know there's battle axes wherever you go, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, she was on a male-dominated council, you know, in Tikrit, and uh, you know even. Um, she just said what was on her mind, which you know I didn't expect. There was no burqa. She just wore Western clothes, and, and all of her teachers did as well. It was kind of um, the most contact I had with uh, Iraqis was during the school sponsoring business, and it was really um, it was really great to see that. I guess we were in a Sunni-dominated area, mm -hmm. and Sunnis are the guys that were very kind of progressive toward women. I mean, even the Baathists um, will tell you that. They, you know, had doctors and lawyers that were women. Um, they were kind of a front runner of the Middle East, if you will. I mean, if you, I guess, if you believe what you read. But I hadn't seen that, you know. I hadn't really. So my experience with the with the sp sponsoring of the school that was uh, that was the first time I saw that. I was really glad to see that. Now you also said um, you worked with Kellogg Brown and Root. Yeah. Um, how did you feel about contractors coming in? Well. Um, like I stated earlier, um, the reserve component has 75% of logistics, mm -hmm. um, and it's a direct relationship between how many soldiers you have on the ground and how much life support you're going to get. Mm -hmm. So for every contractor, that's one less soldier. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I saw it. Now they're getting paid premium dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have their contract, and I mean, and, and, and unfortunately those contracts weren't written really well. They were to provide power distribution. Now what does that mean? What are the response times? You know, I mean, so it's very hard to get them to provide excellent service just because they, when I was there anyway, the standards weren't real clear mm -hmm. about what good service is. So um, we had daily meetings. We, my staff and I had daily meetings with KBR, with the camp manager, who we made sure that they understood what our expectations were for good service, and you know, it was going to be a constant growth. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess in talking to my other peers, we had a great group of KBR people. There were like 1,500 of them at our camp. I mean, they were they were an army into themselves. And you know, the bottom line is it was a it was a replacement for a soldier that didn't have to interrupt their life for you know, you know, thirty thousand dollars a year. You know, mm -hmm. it, so to me, I was always glad to see more contractors take over some of those missions, the logistics missions. Mm -hmm. So things operated fairly smoothly then? On my camp. But mm -hmm. I can tell you, talking to other people, it was just, they got so bureaucratic and they forgot who they were serving, they KBR. So mm -hmm. I think it was a, uh, it was just like anything, you had to really assert yourself. Now that the military are constantly changing out, a lot of times at these camps, these guys stay the same. So it's kind of like when you're on an installation in the States, you have the military changing out and they just kind of you have the garrison that stays, and so they just kind of survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's uh, you have to really put a lot of energy into those relationships for them to affect change. And I just happened to get a good one. You know, I got a, a I had a couple of camp managers that were really good. And we constantly built services for soldiers during the year there, like this camel. KBR paid for the pen, KBR paid for Why the Why don't you show us about that? What do you mean, what camel? Oh, this <laughs> camel. Let me talk to you about our camel. Um, we had a request from uh, soldiers to, uh, to, to uh, they had seen a camel in Kuwait. Uh, 
that was actually near a fob. And they said, hey, why can't we have a camel on our fob? So I said, hey, why can't we? And my boss hated the idea. He is not an animal person. He just, Colonel Frank McGinn, he just, <coughs> damn camel. I mean, you really didn't hear about just camel. You heard, God damn camel. So he was really not interested in hosting this camel on the fob. So dirty, they spit, you know, they're aggressive. Well, one of our interpreters said, hey, I got this great camel. He's, uh, he's actually grown up with a family, and uh, I think this would be the camel for soldiers because this guy, he'll, he'll, you, can't, you can't make him mad. So what we did, we had a sterile area, um, just so and they called me out there to go check out this camel, and I saw him getting his stuff poked, and you know, he, didn't, he seemed very gentle. He seemed like a dog, a big dog. <laughs> And uh, he seemed like he was going to be okay. So I said, well, let's bring him in and see what happens. So we had the pen all set up, and uh, we had a place, we had a veterinarian on staff that actually drew some samples. We had a hell of a time getting the samples cleared. So he was under quarantine for quite some time, which really made those soldiers excited. Because they really wanted to get in there and get a picture of them. It was like two bucks to ride and a uh, dollar for a picture. The problem is we did get a teenage male who was not interested in having anyone on his back. So he was mm -hmm. untrainable with regard to the riding. They have to get on their knees. And I mean, I guess it's a, it's a big deal. The trainer said, I've never seen a camel so stubborn in my life. There's no way I can train this animal to ride people. So he was just a good looking guy, this camel. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a little uh, name, naming contest in Spikey, which I know is not very creative, but that was the most creative. And uh, that's, that's what we got is uh, our name. But, our camel was spiky, and here's a little hold picture it up. Yeah, hold it up. of spiky, I don't know if you can see Yeah, I can, I can zoom right in on it. But that's spiky, and uh, he made his debut about three or four months before I left, and uh, I understand that uh, the owner wanted him back, so we had to, uh, to get rid of spiky right after I left, from what I understand, so okay. that's the story of spiky. But he was, yeah, a buck to take a, this is when he was off limits. So uh, that took a while. So that got people excited about actually seeing him and petting him too. So that probably worked in our favor. Yeah. Now, were you ever rocketed or mortared? Oh at yeah. All? Oh yeah. But again, Spiker. I mean, people people kind of chuckle when they talked about Spiker because Spiker was so large mm -hmm. and they had so much standoff. We had about four kilometers of kilometers of, of wide open desert from our berm. And uh, that's just unheard of on most of these forward operating bases in Iraq. I mean, a lot of them are just right up on the city limits. And, you know, there's just so many places to hide. Spiker, mm -hmm. no way. You know, you put ground surveillance radar out there, and, and you just know when the bad guys are coming. So we had, we enjoyed so much uh, freedom, if you will. You had, mm -hmm. you had to wear all your gear when you went out on the perimeter, obviously. But for the most part, um, maybe about once or twice a week. And then it's just luck of the draw. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, a rocket coming in, that would take people out. I mean, that's just how it is. But what are the odds, especially in an 18 mile wide bar mm -hmm. that you're gonna get? It? I mean, mm -hmm. so when we got, when we got, when we took losses, it was really from the clips that were coming in and out. We hosted all the transportation units. So we had a lot of memorials on our FOB based on what happened to people after they left Spiker. So uh, and we had quite a few IEDs right outside of our gate. Um, one I will never forget. These guys actually got trapped in their Humvee, and uh, you know they would have survived it if their doors hadn't jammed. So, I mean, you know, there's there's just some horrible things that happen. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, Spiker was one of the safer pops. Absolutely. Where did you stay? What were your living conditions like? I actually had a pretty good situation. Um, I I had an office slash home. I had a wall that separated. I had uh, both Cipernet and Nippernet computers on my desk and a DNBT phone on my desk. So I had um, outstanding comps. The building that we occupied had goats in it the month before. So it was uh, it was very dirty when we moved in, but a little bit of paint. Contractors came in and painted it for us because you know we were the garrison and they were kind of worked directly for us. So we got a little preferential treatment that way, but I uh, probably shouldn't say that. Until but it, the place turned right around, and everyone was happy to be part of some place that's, you know, mm -hmm. like that, that's, you know, you cover blossoms right in front of you. Mm -hmm. But I know, compared to a lot of folks um, who lived in these chews with roommates, you know, 
know, I didn't have a roommate. I had I had a bed. I didn't have a cot. Um, and I, I was in a hard stone building, even though it was very leaky when the Chanel's would come in. You know, I got this much dirt in my in my hooch, but still better than a chew, which is really just a little box. Did you have air conditioning, or fans, or? We had fans, mm -hmm. yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm from Florida. I can take the heat. You know, I felt sorry for some of these people, but yeah, it, it, uh, it got hot there, but I can remember the cold, mm -hmm. too. It got cold there. Not New York cold. How about your food? Oh my gosh, the, and this is something else. The chow is in. I mean, I have been Haiti. We were stirring our own, you know what, mm -hmm. and and had MREs every day for two months. We went from that experience in a war environment to a salad bar, a potato bar, a dessert bar, near beer in the refrigerator that, you know, people would, alcoholics in the morning would go in and grab and drink six of, just to kind of, you know. Mm -hmm. Incredible cold soda pop as much as you want, you know. I mean, it's just I actually did see people gain weight there, too. I mean, there's there was just hot chow three meals a day on the fog we were at. Now, there are a lot of fogs that had none of that, but again, we had we were such a large fog over 10,000 soldiers that you know that was you know, we had two huge dining facilities, so chow was excellent. Now, you seem to say in, in your form. You gained a little respect for the 50 to 60 year olds that were there in the I guard? Did. I did. You know, it's no surprise that um, the reserve component and the National Guard specifically is, is older. Their ranks are generally 10 to 20 years older than what I would come to expect in the active component. And I was really concerned about some people. Those, those temperatures were extreme. Buck 30 was not unusual, you know, and. Uh, you know, you have these stereotypes. You don't even realize you have these stereotypes until you see, you know, this white-haired gentleman, you know, moving out sometimes faster than the than the twenty-year-old, but and you realize, wow, you know, that I guess I did think old people couldn't hang, you know, and uh, I was very impressed with with how the National Guard um, soldiers there in our fog carried themselves. Mm -hmm. I think they did great. I think. Uh, I was very impressed. There were uh, quite a few folks in my organization that um, were policemen. And to me, I'm an active duty guy. I get to shoot my weapon maybe, you know, a couple times a year. I just don't handle my weapon like I should. You know, we get issued a weapon because the Army's so safe, you know, it's very controlled. Whereas with a police officer, they're used to sleeping with their weapon. I mean, so I felt safer around cops, you know, that mm -hmm. were wearing a uniform than around soldiers, active duty or you know, other types of soldiers because they they were better shots usually and they were certainly, they were more familiar with operating a firearm. So and there were a lot of advantages that the guard brought to, a lot of civilian skills that the guard brought to the table that I would have never expected or, you know, mm -hmm. I, was, I was proud to be a part of that team. How about, um I, I don't know, did you have a son or daughter? Did you, you didn't say? I did. I have a 10 year old girl. Okay. Well, was what was it like when you left preparing her for that? I know you had been on assignments yes. before, but. Yes, she's, she's kind of. Uh, she knew that, uh, that it was going to be a long year, but mm -hmm. I mean, I said, hey, listen, this is not that different. Every six months, you know, I mean, I'd been on six month appointments before. So it'd be like going on two Kuwaits, you know, is how we kind of phrase it. Because, you know, you get, I could have had that expectation anyway, I was going to get an R&R &R in the middle of there. And, um, you know, there was a lot of support for OIF in her school. I mean, there was a lot of, uh, you know, that was kind of a thing for her to be proud of. So I think her year went relatively well. I mean, she, there, there was a couple kids in her class that said, oh, your mom's going to die. She said, mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know how kids are. Yeah. So, but I think she uh, she kind of took it in stride. I think, um, you know, her dad really spoiled her rotten that year. So that, that helped a lot. Now you got to come home after six months? For R&R, &R, sure did. Was it really difficult to, to go back after two weeks? Oh man, that was wrong to get back on that plane. That uh -huh. was, that was uh, it was like, you know, you feel like you got away with something by surviving that six months. What am I doing going? no sense personally now obviously mm -hmm. you know you're going mm -hmm. but as personally emotionally it is man why am i taking this chance again i have my life i'm 
you just feel like you're gonna you're gonna be one of those ones that don't make it. And you're just so glad when you are, you know. Mm -hmm. So is your husband still in the service? He just retired this year. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, I guess the last thing, one of the last things you you talked about an affiliation with SUNY while you were there. Could you talk about that? Yes, that was probably the highlight of my entire year. Um, there was a tr there was a tremendous individual that I happened to be um, associated with on the FOB. His name is Chief Mike Morris. He was a warrant officer, a food warrant, and uh, he approached me about uh, setting up an education center. This was like during the first month, and we were still trying to figure out, you know, our range cards for for the you know to keep the bad guys out. Like, You're crazy. I, I stiff armed him for quite a while, about two three weeks. But he's very very persistent and said. Listen, there's a lot of a lot of soldiers here that would like to, you know, continue their education. I said, oh, oh, great. So I was really a hard sell initially. I just did not have the time to play with this. This was such a nice to have, and um, I really hadn't figured out my job yet completely. And so I pushed him off for about two months, and uh, finally he said, hey, listen, let's sit down and talk about this. I have, a, you know. 200 students that, that would be interested in taking resident courses, and I think I can get some t-shirts together. So we started we started uh, having meetings. Um, so I got an idea of the interest level on the FOB, and it, it was scary because I would just announce at my mayor's meeting that I was going to have an education meeting, and there would be all these soldiers that would come out of nowhere. They just crowd my my meeting. You know, I would have a meeting at say 1900 at night, and the room would be filled with soldiers. I'm like. Oh my gosh! I'm gonna really have to follow through with this crap, you know. <laughs> so, um, so luckily, this guy Mike Moritz uh, knew these these administrators at SUNY Sullivan County, and uh, we developed this one-page contract over about two weeks that said that if you paid a very nominal fee, like 140 bucks, um, we will accredit this university, and and the soldiers are able to take that back on the transcript. So I was like, wow. This is just insane. How am I going to get instructors? So I started, you know, putting a call out for instructors. Of course, there were a lot more students than instructors, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, we cobbled together a group. Most of them, well, actually, three of the six were uh, active duty. They had never taught anything before. And they had to get their resumes together and be accepted as faculty at SUNY. And uh, it was just so crazy. It was just insane. And uh, we, we got rooms together, we, we got around the books because we used study sheets, and uh, the teachers, the real teachers, you know, from, from, from the guard and the reserve component helped the fake teachers, if you will, the, the, the guys that signed up, yeah, I can do this, algebra, general math, um, history, um, those kind of courses were taught, you know, real basic stuff that people can transfer in and out to other schools. Now, did you have textbooks shipped over? Um, you know what? That got to be too hard because mm -hmm. by the time we had locked in the mm -hmm. semester, you know, there was at least a month lag in the shipping. So that what ended up happening was the tests were based on, mostly on lecture and study sheets. So they were able to get around that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was insane. And and for some reason, this this uh, Sunni among Sunnis got really a lot of press. New York Post put something well, out. Why hold this up? Yeah, that was fun. Um, we got a lot of press. There was a PR. Oh, yeah, the SUNY uh, Sullivan County hired a PR firm to kind of spin this thing as a good news story coming out of Iraq. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, every other day there were reporters flying in, and they got to interview soldiers slash students and um, talk about the uh, this little university. And uh, it was it was there's a lot of fun. It was um, we did two semesters. We were hoping that the unit behind us, the 101st would pick that up, but uh, kind of like I initially took it, it was such mm -hmm. a nice to have, and it took so much effort that uh, I think they never really did anything else with it. Do you want to hold the sweatshirt up? Yes, we actually have a, a, a Spiker University sweatshirt that we had made, and these these got sold for 30 bucks a pop. I had to, you know, just really grab the top of the pile as these were going, but this was a faculty member, so I, we, we got all the faculty members taken care of. But uh, they didn't get paid, those instructors, so this is about all I had to pay. <laughs> <laughs> this was it. So yeah, we sold these to the students for about 30 bucks a pop, and they, they went like that. And sweaters in the desert, when they go, that means there was, there was just a lot of um, 
I think positive memories mm -hmm. of SUNY University, mm -hmm. or, I'm sorry, Spiker University. And uh, that's one of my favorite moments of the year, absolutely. Okay, I guess there was one other photograph you had. You yes. Talk about that too, Another piece of history. <clears throat> um, while we were there, um, there was a big storm down in Louisiana named uh, Hurricane Katrina, and uh, catastrophic. There were actually a lot of units from uh, Louisiana that were on our plot. One of the girls that was born and raised in Louisiana, a lieutenant, um, actually put together a charity fund run. And here, here's a snap of uh, some of the contestants running along our PT route there. And uh, I think they raised over $12,000 to sit down to Katrina, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for soldiers who are pretty cheap and tight, mm -hmm. but that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So that's about a buck ahead for the people that actually were at Spiker. But it was a great event, and um, it's just uh, soldiers uh, probably had pretty similar living conditions to those after Hurricane Katrina, so I thought it was kind of interesting that they would see Katrina victims as, as uh, somebody that needed their help. So, okay. Are there any other anecdotes or something that you'd like to tell us? Well, I think I mentioned before um, just the overall <coughs> New York National Guard. Uh, I was, uh, um, I guess I didn't realize I had the stereotype I had until, you know, it was challenged. And mm -hmm. uh, that, that certainly, um, was something that I, I uh, was able to better appreciate the, the guardsmen and the contributions that they make as a part-time soldier. I just can't imagine doing the Army on a part-time way because of the expectation you know, of an officer or anything. It's just a very tough thing to do in a part-time way. And this, this deployment where soldiers in the New York National Guard had to unplug their whole life you know, from a very unlikely expectation, they deploy into a combat theater. That hasn't happened since Korea. So I was very worried about what sort of soldiers these people would make. And um, I was happily surprised, in most cases, that uh, they were uh, very positive, very patriotic. Uh, there were people fighting to go, which in the regular army, we were mm -hmm. like, whew, missed that one. Mm -hmm. These people were, were dying to get on the team, on the GO team, and were really hurt if they got a medical issue that prevented them. I mean, you can't fake that. They were actually, this was actually how they felt. That they really were proud to be serving. And um, that's, that's hard to find. That's hard to find. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I guess I had a stereotype that I really um, kind of learned from. One of, the, one of the more visible things was, was this weight issue. I saw, I saw people over there, even with three meals a day, PT, you know, where they actually got out and did some physical training, which they probably never had a chance to do in their civilian life. You know, I saw them melt in front of me. I saw people, you know, they actually had this uh, club where they, you know, we lost 700 pounds or whatever. But, I mean, I, I had a couple of folks in my unit. You know, one was a, was a cop. And he just, he lost 45 pounds. I mean, just because mm -hmm. of living in the heat and, mm -hmm. and not snacking at night or you know, just not having a sedentary lifestyle. And uh, he was so, he, he, it was like he grew younger there. So I just thought it was a, it was a very healthy thing for some people to, to deploy into a combat zone, which to me was a little unexpected. So. Now you're finishing your retirement <coughs> zone. Yes. 20 years, how, what do you think, how do, what changes have you seen in the service? What changes have you seen in yourself? How do you think it changed My. you? Oh, I, I never expected to be sitting here for 20 years. I absolutely did not. Um, this, you know, we've gone from a Cold War army, a defensive posture, where mm -hmm. we're waiting for the hordes of Warsaw Pact to come over the hill, to a, an agile, light, uh, tomorrow, go to war for a limited conflict. It, it, it's tremendous changes in the army since I came in, um, we, we experienced the fat years, the Reagan years, you know, and, uh, and the not so, not so uh, fat years as well. But I think the biggest change in the Army was, since I got in, was Desert Storm. You know, people kind of were able to rally behind the world's best Army, and I think, you know, that's what Americans pay for in their taxes. They want to know that we are respected, and I think, 
you can be respected. But if you have something to back that up, say an army that wins, you know, that's that's a hell of a lot of more more clout in the world. So I think that I saw the army stock go way up in my time, and it just seems like it continues to to rise as uh, we continue to fund these, these crazy budgets. But I think uh, our national strategy is one that requires a Army, that's top notch. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.